Well, thank you very much for accepting talking to us. And the first thing I'd like to ask you is for you to give us some glimpse of your life, why you are interested in gender questions and problem of length. How did you come up with these uh, <coughs> questions? Well, it's uh, very interesting because uh, uh, when I was a student in the United States, uh, when I was in Ethiopia, um, I went to a private school, a fairly comfortable family background, and I really resented the student movement. I thought they are disrupting our education, mm -hmm. kind of a very reactionary uh, outlook. And then when I went to the US, I heard there was an Ethiopian student movement. I was, of course, alienated by the time I went to, I was alone and so forth. So I saw it as a sort of joining rather than a political project. And then they really gave me the shock of my life because um, having gone to a private school, I hardly knew anything about Ethiopia. We learned about you know, the American revolution, the French, blah, blah, and not really our own history, our own uh, culture. And this uh, student movement, <coughs> one of the most active student movements in the world at that time, was really rereading Ethiopian history through critical ways. and. So it, it was a tremendous eye-opener uh, for me, and also it made me feel really ignorant because I didn't know any of that stuff. So by having joined the Ethiopian student movement, then I came across, they were uh, a Marxist group, clearly that was their uh, aspiration. So I then had to learn a bit about Marxism, um, and that happened historically, coincidentally, also the biggest moment of uh, the civil rights movement and the feminist movement in the US. So I joined these streams uh, because if you are on campus, you either stayed away completely or you are part of that. And each one of these three coincidences contributed to my feeling that I needed to, more, to know more about X, Y, Z. So when I finished my BA, I went home to do uh, research on labor migrants to the coffee farms. And that's when the revolution broke out in Ethiopia. <coughs> I always claimed it's because I returned, but that's of course far from the truth. Um, and so I had to stay in Addis. I couldn't go to the place where um, I was hoping to go and do my field work. But since I had already withdrawn from going to graduate school at that time, I took a, I was, friends convinced me to go to this rural development project that was a joint Swedish Ethiopian government project, uh, which dealt with the rural development. And I realized then that um, I had to do something about um, the condition of women in Ethiopia. And I first wrote when I was in the student movement in the US about the condition of uh, women in Ethiopia, the women question in Ethiopia, in, in keeping with the tradition. And uh, a, a colleague of mine sent me a long critique about how my paper was really influenced by Western feminism and didn't say anything about the realities that are going place in Ethiopia, especially rural women and uh, working class women and so forth. This is a typical male reaction whenever a, a, a a feminist talks from, but this particular one really resonated with me because all my references, of course, were who said what in the West and so forth and so on. So I really felt that I needed to think through who are Ethiopian women really uh, and, and what are the challenges that are facing them. So when I went to this rural development, um, I could see the daily lives, the daily crimes of rural women and how they coped or didn't cope. <laughs> and uh, so I, I wrote, the first thing I wrote about was the condition of women in Ethiopia and focused on the issue of land, which is from which they are completely excluded. And how to this day there is a myth that um, in, in, in Africa, um, Ethiopian women are the least involved in agriculture, which is absolutely not true. They do not, because culturally uh, are forbidden, they don't actually uh, farm. 
you know, do uh, physical. physical. No, they do physical work, but they can't, uh, you know, we use animals to prepare the land. Culture forbids that they do that because there is a belief that there will be drought and blah, all kinds of stuff. And um, other than that, they participate fully in every aspect. Agriculture is not just about digging that. So, uh, but because that is considered the most um, important, all the writings, even so-called feminists would come and say, oh, Ethiopia is exceptional in the sense that women don't do agricultural work. So I have been you know, in debates about what is agricultural work. So anyway. Um, so I, I, I got interested in this issue of uh, land uh, because, you know, 85% of the people in Ethiopia live in rural areas. And of those, of course, more than half are women. And, and regardless of changes, like the first land reform project in Ethiopia said that women should have equal uh, right to the land. Of course, that didn't happen. This regime that has been in power since... Um, 1991 uh, made it slightly better because they came from a, a armed struggle experience from armed struggle which you would understand and um, they in in the area where they struggled they had to make a lot of concessions to mobilize women I don't think it's because they believed in gender equality but they needed the participation of women in the front and the way they did it was by saying when we, we are victorious, both men and women will have equal uh, land. And that stuck, in a way it, it, it you know, became. But what we didn't really look into when we were advocating, uh, calling for land to the tiller, mm -hmm. or equal uh, land between men and women, was the challenges once these people had that piece of land. I mean, in Ethiopia there have been so much subdivision of land. Farmers have the land, the piece of this table at most, less than half an, half an hectare. 70% of people have less than that. So it's a very, very small piece of land to begin with. So let's assume that you and your husband have equal access. In reality, it has very little meaning for both of you, really. So people engage in multiple uh, livelihoods in order to they will maintain that land, they are very attached to that land, and it does make in some vague sense for a woman to feel that she's also the owner of that piece of land. But in terms of their own life and changes in their own lives, it has very little impact. So um, we didn't think about the broader issues that also needs to accompany that kind of uh, a legal measure which ensures equality of land. Uh, first, how the, ch the, land, the issue of land is changing because of the overall macroeconomic uh, structure. And secondly, uh, because they need very much more than just a piece of paper that says you have a, a legal ownership of this piece of land. So right now, um, I am keeping my interest in this question uh, precisely because if women uh, or if Ethiopia is ever going to have a democratic uh, possibility, um, the women will have to be involved. Um, but we we continuously need to to define these terms that we use, like democracy, like land rights, and so forth, in terms of a broader issue of what it, how what is it in the lives of people that we want to change and. So I have maintained my interest. In no, I, I understand, and I'm I'm really glad that you brought up that that in depth explanation because it takes me to a second question. And I know you have been very involved in the academic environment. How do you see in Ethiopia, not just in Ethiopia, because you have a broader experience in African context, the relationship between research, engaged research, and changes in the way we think about our own realities? And then we can produce younger scholars to be really involved with academic and social and political change. And not just academics that want to keep the model and just stay in the academics for the sake of academics. Mm. Well, I think, you know, I have been lucky enough um, that when I could no longer live in Ethiopia because of the deteriorating political situation under a military dictatorship, I went to live in Senegal. Um, 
prior to that, I was lucky enough to have gone to a quote-unquote progressive university uh, with people who questioned the whole framework of um, Western hegemony and wanted to encourage the rewriting of people's history. Um, so <clears throat> following that, I went to um, live in Senegal. And what um, Codestria was trying to do at that time um, was, when I first went to Senegal, it was to establish a women's research organization because we felt that Western women were talking on our behalf and we had no voice. They would invite us to say a conference like this and we won't even be asked to, to give a paper. We, just, we were just there for window dressing. So uh, a, a bunch of women who experienced that got really upset and they said, why don't we set up our own research um, uh, institution? And we did that. So it was housed within Podestria. So this coincided for me two things. One, you know, Western feminism not being very sensitive to voices of African women, the works of African women. But also, despite the fact that Codestria was considered a progressive organization, they were also resistant to including issues on gender in the main program of work. Uh, <clears throat> so we pushed, at the minute a Senegalese friend of mine by the name of Maria Angelique Savani and I walk into a Codestria meeting, they would say, oh yeah, and there is the gender issue. We really have to deal with that. But of course, their paper never said this and, and so forth. So um, we pushed and pushed. And then I realized when I, my term finished with an award, um, I realized the best place for me to work was Codestria. Because at that time, uh, there was this whole questioning of what is an African scholarship? And, and what, is, what makes it different? than scholarship elsewhere. And to this day, there is this debate about how practical research should be and how, why it need not be necessarily or automatically um, uh, t attached to some uh, practical project, but should have meaning for Africa. So this whole issue of you know, uh, research for research sake versus practical research it's still on the agenda, it's not been resolved, but in, in terms of the, the, most, the loudest voices within Codestria, um, the argument is that research should not be defined with, with, from a, a point of view of being practical, that research could be done in such a way that whoever is doing the practical work can take lessons out of it. Because if you start by saying that research really has to be practical, you shouldn't be doing research for research sake. It limits the scope and the questions that one asks. Um, one, that was one lesson I learned from having worked uh, within a Codestria framework and interacting with African scholars from all over the continent. Um, the second thing was whose theory should African scholarship prioritize? And I think that is one of the biggest re-education I had coming from a Western education um, where you felt you had to quote all the big names in sociology before you get to the topic of your own paper or your own country. Uh, here was a, a, an organization that was saying, no, that's not a valid starting point for a research. You have to uh, review the work of African scholars, which is equally if not more, legitimate. Uh, and secondly, define research priorities in terms of what you think are important for your continent, your students, your country, etc. And And that really uh, completely changed my own point of view because I was one of those people who felt that if I were to write on the center and the periphery, which you refer to today, I have to go through the works of Emmanuel Wallerstein and Ari Gee and all the world, um, world systems people before mentioning maybe one or two African scholars who might have written about it or like you who might have questioned who defines the center. So um, this whole project was fantastic for me because it made me realize that 
the research, even among progressives, were, um, was limiting if you're from, a, from a, the South. Because the, the tradition that has been established uh, does not allow for innovative breakouts of other peoples. And so, you know, that's one lesson that I learned and I enjoyed uh, tremendously. But also being in Kodesria um, pushed me to, um, to open, to, to contest gatekeeping because the scholars who established Kodesria and who were very active in, 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 in leadership positions um, didn't think about the younger generation much and women, of course. And so uh, for me, my biggest struggles became emphasizing African debates because I was privileged enough to run the publication program. And so I wanted Africans to debate their own issues and really sought a debate to go on about whatever might be of interest to us. Uh, secondly, insisted that it should be opened to young people and to female scholars so that it no longer is this, you know, who is the person who wrote the most and should be invited kind of thing, which is fine. They still come and they still uh, are always present, but a new generation uh, that didn't have the same kind of scholarship possibilities and so forth. I was um, <clears throat> fortunate enough to work with Tandika Makandawari, who also uh, was moved by at least including the youth in the and the difficulties that young scholars were having within African universities and in the world generally, because their education was deteriorating and they weren't having the same kind of capacities. So he wrote this piece, I don't know if you have seen it, The Fourth Generation of African Scholars, which opened a whole host of debates um, for young people coming into the, uh, in the and, and, and for, uh, for Kodesia it also meant that together with structural adjustment, which really came out and said Africans don't need any, research, any university education, uh, to start training itself. I mean, Kodesia initiating a training program, um, which the design of it and everything required a different kind of approach, bringing in African scholarship, challenging young people who are coming to the training program to think um, and be proud of being African scholars. Um, so it was more than just technical training in the sense of being able to do research, but to think critically about what's happening in Togo, who is, who's producing the, 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 the knowledge there, and is it valid? Who are the Togo lead scholars who are thinking and working and so forth? So it was very exciting in that sense of bringing it. And the, and the same, no, I wouldn't say the same, but uh, some efforts to also engender in, in the work of Kodesia. It, uh, Kodesia did a lot, especially in Panamini, a lot of impact, and that you follow in that path mm. to get more younger people to know what has been published. Mm. And in a sense, as I was trying to make the point, that we need to provincialize the world and to know what are the core issues of each region mm. and how these core the thematic areas and so on need to dialogue, to create a dialogue because the conditions are not the same. The same. And, but we tend to see that the global south is all the same. So if I speak from Singapore, that problem was going to be identified as by somebody else in another place and will be able to read it. And it brings me to the third question, because it has been a, a very problematic question here, sometimes in said to discuss what is colonialism about. Because mm. colonialism is very metamorphic. It, it changes, it depends on the mm. context, on the time. Mm. And quite often we tend to assume that there were only uh, imperial colonies in Europe and we tend to say like, no, there was the Ottoman Empire in our side, yes. there was the Indian Empire. So once you move to the Indian side of Africa, then the things get to be reshaped. Mm. Mm. And at the same time, this idea that we don't contribute, I have not contributed in the last centuries to so-called world knowledge mm. changes dramatically once we start going back exactly. to this historical research. So I just wanted to know from your experience how we have been able, as we have been in South Africa, to explain this problem. Because 
I would dare to say that in South Africa, that is a really problem. South they Africans are the ones that say that they are the reference of Africa. They, they are, yes, they think so. I have to give you a, 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 a personal anecdote before I answer your question. Um, could this, I mean, South Africa opened UNICEF branch in Ethiopia. And um, so um, the ex-president Mbeki came to open the, 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 the campus. And he made a very dramatic statement, which I always tell people about. He says, we are not here to teach only. UNISA has a lot to learn from this country's history. First, you have to learn about the history of this place, what it did towards changing colonial perceptions, etc., in all its problems currently, uh, as well as share whatever knowledge is being taught in, in UNISA. And everybody was like, what? I mean, what is he talking about? But it's true that well, the point he was trying to make is that it, exactly what you just said that each place and each um, country has its own history and its own specificities. There are generalities, but nonetheless, we also need to bring out that which is different. Um, you know, today at lunchtime, I had, uh, I, I had this debate with this uh, person sitting next to me, and I told her, I am very uncomfortable with this conclusion that the Russian Revolution, if had, had it not been for the Russian Revolution, there wouldn't be decolonization. I'm like, I, I said, I really am very uncomfortable with that kind of general statement. She said, but it's true. I said, it's not. Why would you say that? Because anti-colonial struggles predated the Russian Starting Revolution. Starting from the Haitian Revolution and so on. Yeah, All even, even before the Haitian Revolution, uh, colonized Africans and uh, slaves were rebelling, you know. So my sense of resistance and rebellion is that wherever there is extreme oppression, people organize in their own way to resist that. Uh, the fact that they don't succeed mm -hmm. does not necessarily mean that they were influenced by somebody else. That was all. my argument this, this afternoon, mm -hmm. because uh, in Mozambique in the center, along the Zambezi River, there is this huge, what they'll call revolt. Mm -hmm. Because we cannot have revolutions. Revolutions have to be uh, or to create a modern state. Mm. And that was the state was already the colonial period mm. was already defined. And it is a really interesting process because it were women who initiated it because there was the first world war going on. Women men had been called to join the Portuguese army mm. because Portuguese joined the first world war because the war started in Mozambique. It was mm. Portuguese territory. So mm. to speak, so women were complaining that they were sexually being assaulted by the Portuguese, that they had all this tax taxation upon them, mm. they were forced to open roads and so on. So they started together with mediums that were also calling to uh, for revolution to reject. Mm. to reject. But what was interesting, it was not against the white people; it was mm. against Portuguese colonialism because colonial was the big word. Mm. They will call, well, we are colonists, we are coming to help you. Mm. And they were saying no. And it took about 30,000 people to put it down. Mm. So, and my question was, why is Russian Revolution a revolution? In this, it is a project of another country that is not the Portuguese colony, not taken as a revolution. Mm. It's a revolt. Mm. As the frame will be to create a nation state, and then you can create a revolution. Yeah. That no, they it's a straight jacket, you know. Yes. So the fact I don't deny that the Russian Revolution was uh, uh, had very many inspiring uh, influences, but to say that to go as far as um, uh, Castro did, that the colonization would not have taken place if it wasn't for the Russians, is to really underestimate, undermine, underwrite people's history, because. Um, it could be argued the other way around, the fact that colonial peoples were revolting. It influenced uh, Marx, it influenced Engels and others, who might not have referred to it, but um, saw the possibility that there is a revolt every time there is extreme oppression, not necessarily of the proletariat alone, but other oppressed. Uh, 
So I think we should open the discussion and attenuate it because, you know, even the Russia revolution, well, that was the message throughout the day and to, to, your, to your own panel, is that the Russian revolution has silenced a lot of participants within it that needs to be brought up even now. Um, you know, this uh, woman uh, said today that, and, and others have written, that it is women who actually sparked the revolution. You never see that in a typical history of the Russian revolution uh, because of the patriarchal nature of history, how, how history is written and how they are always silenced. So um, this need to uh, question assumptions, I hope, is what the centennial will make possible, that you can celebrate a people's victory, although Putin doesn't want to do that. But um, at the same time, you can also question it and say, look, you know, it was a, a very interesting project. But there are very many, I mean, that's what I was talking to this guy about, because he said, you know, the Haitian revolt is not getting any write-ups you know, in terms of its impact. But it is a very major revolution, which put down uh, an extremely oppressive system and um, you know they might not be the, the world power, but they sparked the idea amongst very many people that actually slaves can uh, put down slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just the Christians who campaigned against slavery. They contributed. No, well, I mean, I don't think we should go from one denial to another. It's just but the, put this the together. context, yeah, and all the forces that brought about, you know, like you said, the Mozambican women, uh, the women of Nigeria, the women of Cameroon, in Kenya. Clearly, if you want to write an objective history, they played a huge part in the anti-colonial struggle. In some cases, they started it. But if you read the history... It's the neutral. It, they are not even there. Thing. They are not even there. They are not, I mean, it's not accounted for. Uh, at one point, it was the in thing to talk about women and uh, the anti-colonial struggle, or you know, and so forth. But now it's again disappeared, and so you would hear about the Nkrumahs and the so forth and the so on, uh, but not what, how they they also depended, basically. On Even the the liberation struggle, because I've been carrying out interviews mm -hmm. about the liberation struggle. Because I was trying to understand what was going on, and I was really shocked over and over again. There will be this sort of message: Yeah, we were the supporters because we fed guys, yep. we gave them shelter, and they were talking about having three chambers: one for the family, the other for the Portuguese, the other for Ferlimo to feed. So they were not just working one part; they had to work three times more. Yes, and then they say, and we would carry guns. We'll give information. So basically, this is the backbone of a guerrilla war. Exactly. It's not just to shoot. To shoot, it's an episode. It's a yeah. micro episode. Exactly. Who carry out the big war? Are mm -hmm. women? And then they say, yeah, we were the supporters. Yeah. And then the end was over, and we just became women. Yeah. And it's something that yeah. suddenly you just feel that there is a, another perspective about the war. There is, of course. It's not written. That's the problem. Uh, in, in Ethiopia, you know, the a big uh, milestone in our history is the defeat of the Italians in 1886 in Adwa. And everybody talks about the king the, and the, with some kind mention of the queen, but not in the very same sense. First of all, she's the one who mobilized the population. She said, we're not going to accept this, we're going to go fight this. Now, some people will admit that very reluctantly. Secondly, thousands and thousands of women had to carry huge uh, cooking materials, drinking stuff, and so forth, all the way to, you know, huge, it's just the distance you cannot believe. They had to walk. And they would camp in a particular village because at night they can't go anywhere. And the feeding, the sexual services, whatever went into keeping the moral and the energy of those soldiers was actually on the backs of women. If you read about um, Adwa, women are absent. In fact, today, that's what I really presented 
uh, there was a discussion there is going to be a big Africa-wide um, uh, African museum, but named after Adwa and whatever people did for anti-colonial struggles. And today was a debate about how, what structure it should take and so forth. So the historians who wrote the concept paper, once again, they are out. Yeah, they haven't put it in, you know, and I just don't know when it is that it will become a routine part of a conversation to tell the whole story. Uh, and it really, people say, why are you upset? I say, look, you know, after a hundred years, we're still repeating the same stuff. Um, and so, you know, anyway, and it's a female minister who didn't even comment on <laughs> the concept paper. I tend to say that sometimes we have very fascist female minister. Yeah. The, the ideology is there. Yeah, it's, it's like, like, you know, we, we support it. It's, it's, it's in your head. No. And, and you cannot see yourself as a, the major actor. You're, you're secondary. By your own admission, you, you become a supporter when in fact you weren't the supporter. And, so. and that was the interesting thing that talking to these women, because there was an episode very interesting, because Mueda in the north, it's like the core of the struggle. And there was a, a mutiny of women, 300 women, who went to talk to the colonial administrator and in the to the representatives of the political police, Portuguese political police say, give back our husbands and the money you took from them. Okay. If you don't give us back our husbands, we're not going to work because they, mm. they had to do farming, mm. compulsory farming. We're not, we're going to go on strike. 300 women. And I was like, this is 1972. Mm. And nowhere, this is everywhere in the political police reports, mm. be aware of those women. Give back yeah. the men and yeah. give back the money because we need to the, keep their, their labor, race, their labor, and we need the reproduction of the labor force. They are the keepers of the situation, and no one talks about it. No, that. no. It's no. like it yeah. disappears. How can 300 women mobilize? Yeah. First, to mobilize because you don't show up at the police station exactly. out of the blue 300 people. Yeah, by cell phone. There were no cell phones. They had to no. organize. It means they were talking, they were discussing the no. situation. And there was a point of rupture when they mobilized and they did a small revolution. Yes. Because they were women and they were challenged to pull it. Exactly. The same thing in South Africa. I always argue that ANC was started by women. The, 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 the real struggle against, and, and of course, I mean, if you don't mention the Mandelas and the others <laughs> doing, or like doing some sacrilege, but the past laws, mm -hmm. which is exactly, exactly the yes. same question with the, for the Mozambican women which forbade them to come to see, to see their husbands or to do whatever, to work. Um, they rejected it, they burnt it and, 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 and demonstrated, you know, and the South African uh, apartheid keepers were like shocked that these women would actually march and burn this uh, ID card that forbade them, that limited their mobility. And that sparked that kind of protest against that part. You, you, you read an ANC document and you will see some write-up about the Women's March somewhere else, but not as a core history of ANC. But you could go from South Africa to the other extremes. In each country, it, there is the same story. That the, the very significant role that women played, um, and it, with their own initiative, not because men mobilized them. In fact, they never thought of mobilizing them. It's vice versa, when they saw that they had done something extraordinary outside the realm of patriarchal assumptions or imaginations, then they would say, ha, huh, okay. I mean, these women, yeah, like these women have a lot to, uh, to do. So if, you know, uh, we were to rewrite African history and ask these questions, how is it that in each country this part of the history is uh, left out? I think it would be a massive yeah. Service. I to, see. I know. I, I agree with you, but I think we need to put together and challenge Kodesh here, okay. because to define who liberate, who is liberating Africa mm. as a project, because not something that is done in Mozambique. That was my argument today. That it's not the problem of Cubans in Angola. The liberation of Angola was the product of liberation of Zambia. Zim so it comes down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was a wave of liberation and of support. I can't say that we got liberated just because there was armed struggle. There was support yeah. 
from Zambia, there was support. Yeah, was in countries that were having so much problem. I remember I lived in Zambia for a while. There was and big bombed all the time. And and shortage, complete shortage, because they blocked them. South Africa okay. wouldn't send anything, and um, so forth. And a large contingency of liberation fighters living there, from South Africa, from um, uh, there was Muslim, Angola, Mozambique, Mozambique Namibia, um, all Namibia, right. living there. Uh, in a country which itself was facing tremendous pressures from the West, they didn't want mm -hmm. them there. They didn't want so-called uh, radicals uh, and so forth. And Tanzania, the same thing, even mm -hmm. worse than Zambia, at least had some better resources. Um, but what you hear about is the help of Cuba and the Soviet Great. Union and China. I'm like, okay, they helped, but hey. There were other people that but were Actually, really there is a very... I was in uh, Western Sahara, and there was this wonderful story. I'll tell you just before we finish. I, I was... They have a museum of um, the armed, armed struggle, a huge quantity of ammunition and guns mm. that they, com they confiscated from the Moroccans. But suddenly I was looking, there was some um, big cars, assault cars, and it's like, Looks like a South African car because mm. I remember seeing them in pictures yes. from Soweto and so on. So I said, but this looks like South Africa. Yeah, we confiscated 76 you see? from Morocco because South Africa was selling them to Morocco. And but they were pretty new. And I said, Well, did you clean them? No, no, they were pretty new. But then we did something very nice because of the solidarity, and I said, Yes. We gave 40 back to Namibian forces to fight to swap or to fight South Africa. So can you imagine I that know, the, the I South know. African guns went yeah. back mm -hmm. to swap because of this struggle? So this is a good example how we help liberating exactly. with different struggles. I mean, you know, Ma Mandela when he came out of prison, he came yeah. to Ethiopia, and the military government, of course, wanted to take credit. He said, "No, no, I'm sorry. I came to say thank you." to the Ethiopian people and to the emperor who no longer is there because he gave me an Ethiopian passport with which I could do my political work because he was he no longer had a passport in South Africa. Mm -hmm. We were also shocked because we couldn't even imagine Haile Selassie mm -hmm. being that generous. Then came uh, the Zimbabwe liberation, uh, the independence. And Mugabe said, look, this guy who is leaving Ethiopia is coming to Zambia because he helped us train our liberation fighters, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, we don't even know our own history. And these are like real reactionary military dictator, oh, king in one sense, and one who believed he was sent by God, another one who uh, was a real dictator. But at the same time, they had this notion of helping other African countries. This, this is the thing that you know, fakes that there is a responsibility to free them because they are people like me, yeah. the dignity mm -hmm. of the African people. And that has been what has I think that we really need to push for. Mm. Well, thank you so sure. much for sure. the conversation. Yes.